beautiful day to be with you all today, and I just wanted to thank Bailey again so much for her testimony. What a blessing and a privilege to be here and share the stage with her this morning. Um, that just really, really blessed my heart, so thank you for sharing. Um, my name is Grace Utomo, and this is my husband, Ivan Utomo. We're from San Jose, California, and um, we are so excited to be here with you today. Um, we are going to be talking about uh, an accident that happened in my life and how God has worked in our lives after that. Um, our talk is called Walking with Grace. God's grace, um, just clarifying, embracing God's goodness in trauma. Um, and that's also the title of a book that um, came out last year. So if you guys are interested, we are um, having a special uh, deal for Wheaton students. Um, I'll have a QR code up after um, the service. Um, so to start about what we're going to talk about today is what is Christian resilience or biblical resilience? Um, our culture is obsessed with resilience. Um, you know, doctors, we go to doctors, we ask, you know, for are there, you know, prescriptions or, you know, new mental health drugs. We go and see psychologists. We try new diets or we try new exercise regimes. We're always trying to make ourselves more resilient, more able to cope with stress, more able to bounce back from um, tragedy or, you know, mental health issues or trauma. Um, but what does the Bible say about resilience? And that's what I, why I asked to have the passage read that Bailey read for us. Um, you know, what, as Christians, you know, what do we do when something really bad happens? Like, like Bailey noted, you know, it's easy to be like, oh, I'll pray for you. Or, you know, God works everything together for good, you know, and smile and keep going. But, you know, when something really bad happens to you, then you're like, this is terrible, <laughs> you know? So suddenly suddenly the, the things that we toss off don't really seem to work anymore. And, and we, we, we do feel covered in darkness or like we're plunging down into this spiral and we're like, you know, where is God? You know, wh what, what happens now? So as I tell you our story, you know, I ask you to think about, you know, where, where was God in this for me and Ivan and whatever you may be going through, whether it's health related or mental health or relationships, or maybe you're having a pretty great life right now, but um, something might happen in the future. You know, what, what is your first instinct when something happens? Do you, do you call out to God? Do you call out to something else? Um, where, where do you turn? Um, so to start off, a little bit about us. I'll let Ivan go first because his story is more interesting than my, mine at first. So. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, it's, it's a joy to be here. It's our first time visiting Wheaton, and just this room is just so beautiful. And um, it's been such a blessing and encouragement to us already just to be here. So thank you for allowing us to just share some time with you. Um, I'm originally from Indonesia. I was born there, and uh, my family... Do we, oh, okay, there you go. We got some uh, Indonesian <laughs> Presentation going on. Um, so we moved around a few times between there and California growing up. Um, and I started playing piano when I was about five years old. And I was one of those kids that really hated practicing. And my mom had to make me sit down at the piano and practice. Um, and it wasn't until my junior year of high school that I realized that I love playing piano. And I decided to major in it in college. My other choice was neuroscience. So uh, pretty similar there. Um, but now as a teacher, I get to work with, uh, I'm at a K-12 school. I work mostly with high schoolers and junior hires, so I'm on the other side of that now where I'm trying to push these students to develop uh, the gifts that God has given them. Um, but Grace and I met in college at California Baptist University for undergrad, which is where we met uh, Jesse Tates as well and her husband Jericho, so that was where um, our connection is. And we met uh, at a music group called the University Choir and Orchestra where I played piano and Grace was playing violin. Yes, so um, I also grew up playing music. I grew up in the States. My family is from Savannah, Georgia, but we moved around quite a bit because my dad first went to seminary in LA to be a pastor. Um, and then we moved between churches a little bit growing up. Um, so I started violin, quote, by accident. God doesn't do anything by accident, but as far as why I picked violin, um, I was homeschooled and my homeschool group was doing, you know, free art, ballet, and violin lessons, and I randomly picked violin. 
um, didn't know what it was at all. But it turned out that like within a few weeks, my teacher kind of figured out that I was a pretty gifted child and you know suggested that I start private lessons instead of group lessons. Um, and much to my parents' dismay, because they were seminary students and that was not in the budget, but um, God was good and provided a way for me to study music at that time and all the way through high school. And um, I don't know how many music students we have in here or serious music students that, you know, the practicing rule of, you know, two hours plus per day. Um, you know, I was, I was really serious in high school. So I was practicing, you know, like four hours a day. You know, I was in youth symphony. I was doing chamber music. So you guys, some of you guys can identify with that. Um, but um, I, I really, really wanted to go to a top school. That was, that was my dream. And so, um, you know, the three top schools that get often listed are Juilliard, Curtis, and Eastman. And um, I ended up at Eastman, and I ended up with the professor I wanted, which was just all the hand of God. Um, I didn't know how hard it was to get in at that time. No one had told me, which was also the hand of God, because I wouldn't have tried out if I had known. Um, the, the teacher that I wanted only took about two to three students a year. Uh, 2,000 to 3,000 students try out at Eastman per year. So if you look at this whole room of people, that's a lot of people. <laughs> so I would have never tried out, but... Um, God led me to, and he provided a way, and I was, quote, living the dream, because, I mean, that's what everyone wanted. But um, when I got there, I realized that that was not where God wanted me, that it was actually a really ungodly environment. The thing that kept bothering me was professors would say, oh, music is your God. Literally, I'm not exaggerating. If you were having a bad rehearsal or whatever, you know, they'd be like, you're not putting enough into it or you're not committed enough or whatever, you know, like music is your God. And it, it always reminded me of like Daniel and the statue in Babylon, you know, where um, the king's telling them to bow down to it. And, um, and at first I thought it, I could, you know, get away without it wearing on me, but eventually it became clear that I was being taught to idolize music, and I, 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 if I was going to love the Lord with my whole heart, um, that I, I needed to go somewhere else where I wasn't being coached to pour my entire self into something that wasn't God, um, which that led me to transfer to Cal Baptist, where I met Ivan, um, and God had... Um, obviously plans for us. We um, met Ivan's junior year and we got married um, six months after I graduated um, from undergrad. Ivan was in grad school. Um, still, I worked at just like a admin assistant job at our university, but I played violin all the time. I, I had a studio and I played gigs and I was a ringer in several local orchestras. And we had a wedding business, so it was, you know, idyllic, um, honestly. Like, God was just so good to us, and we were just so blessed that, you know, the first 11 months of marriage, people always warn you that marriage is going to be so hard, and we were like, Lord, this is pretty awesome. Like, <laughs> you know, this is, like, really too good to be true. Um, and it was, <laughs> because... 17 days before our first wedding anniversary, I was walking across the street to perform at a Christmas concert. It was December 3rd, 2016, and um, I stepped out onto my crosswalk, my pedestrian light said go, and um, 11 seconds into the, the light blinking for me to go and the red light to, for the cars to stop, um, a car drove through the red light and struck me as I was walking in the crosswalk. Um, and I, this is a trigger warning for the, the next picture does show me in the hospital. Um, there's no blood or injuries shown, but if you have trauma in your background or your family's background, uh, it may be a little difficult to look at. So just warning, you don't have to look if you don't want to. Um, I'll show the picture and then try to move on, but um, there we go. So yeah, I was, I was struck by the car as they were going about 45 miles an hour. Um, the, Security camera footage shows they did not hit their brakes. Um, they just drove right into me. Um, and I sustained about um, a trauma severe traumatic brain injury, uh, two strokes, two brain bleeds, um, 
uh, bilateral tibial plateau fractures, so basically both of my knees were really badly broken and I had to have orthopedic surgery on both sides, um, a skull fracture, pel pelvic fracture, and other injuries. Um, I was not supposed to survive the night, um, and I was you know, put into a coma because they didn't think that I would, if I did survive the night, they didn't think I would be able to tolerate the pain. Um, and then when I came out of the coma because of the brain injuries, they didn't know if I was going to be vegetable or a small child or what. So um, yeah, Ivan, if you wanna take over from there. Yeah, so that takes us into, um, I think the next slide will show what yeah, we're we you know, looking back on it now, realizing we're the critical years where, um, in the interest of time, I'll try to uh, provide an overview of what that first year was like. We, it felt like we were living in medical facilities, basically, just um, in and out of the ER, um, doctor's offices, inpatient stays, all sorts of um, just medical appointments. And uh, I think now looking back on it, um, there is no possible explanation for how either of us made it through that first year other than just God's mm -hmm. grace sustaining us every step of the way. I think humanly speaking, looking back on it, it just, even now, today, it, it's impossible to kind of describe what, it, what it's like to kind of live through such an intensive phase like that. When Grace woke up from her coma, um, she couldn't talk, and um, it took her about eight weeks for her brain to kind of grow back up from uh, kind of like a baby age to a toddler age, and um, praise God, you know, he has restored a whole lot of functionality. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, we dealt with just a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, both her knees were broken, so she, could, she couldn't put any weight on her legs for about the first three months, and then it took another six months to relearn how to walk. Um, and so that is also kind of why we decided to call um, our book, Walking with Grace, Walking with God's Grace, but I literally got to walk with my wife, Grace, as well, um, helping her learn how to walk again. And that picture on the left is the very first time that she was able to stand after her accident, after a lot of physical therapy and, um, yeah, just a lot, a lot of ways that we saw God helping us through these years. Yes, and so then by the end of 2017, I was I was recovering. I was you know able to stand and walk around a little bit, but um, and we we were hopeful for the future for future. But God had other plans, and I started to develop very serious a seizure disorder that um, doctors really had no idea what to do with, and they 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 thought that the seizures were probably coming from the interaction between my severe traumatic brain injury and then the two two stroke areas because I had also had two strokes. And the seizures, they looked epileptic um, in nature, but um, they, they didn't really read on an EEG machine, and so that was made them very difficult to treat. Um, I went to all sorts of different doctors and different specialties and tried different therapies. Um, and really nothing could control the seizures. I was hyper light sensitive. Um, we lived in Silicon Valley, so I mean, everybody has the super bright car headlights now, but back in 2017, you know, we were like the test zone for them. So I was, you know, blinded everywhere, you know, even during the daytime by lights. And it, it became so dangerous that, you know, even, you know, someone's phone light going off could trigger a seizure, um, you know, a car putting on their blinkers to turn left could trigger a seizure, police car turning on their lights could trigger a seizure. Um, I couldn't go to church because if the projection screen glitched, that was, a tr that was a seizure. You know, if someone was on their phone reading their Bible and something glitched, um, you know, that was a seizure. So basically I, w I became trapped in doors in my dark apartment with only these incandescent light bulbs for about, as you can see, four to five years um, because the doctors couldn't figure out the right medicine. They, they suggested I try um, psychotherapy as well and that didn't work. Um, and I, my life was about hiding from lights and I also developed um, severe migraines during that time as well. Um, and, and so that's that's where we go back to you know what is resilience um, because I'm you know literally stuck inside this 700 square foot apartment and my husband goes to work every day um, but my version of getting out on the town is you know once a week my family puts me on 
um, puts like these really dark shades on me and you know I close my eyes and they lead me to the car and then they stuff me in the back seat like either a celebrity or a hostage you know <laughs> depending on how I was feeling that week which which one I chose to be um, and you know we would drive to like the local coffee shop and they would get coffee to go and then you know they would bring it back in the car and I would drink it you know still in the back back seat hiding from you know all the lights outside and then they would you know whisk me back to my apartment and you know stuff me back in and then repeat the following Friday and that was my life for years and and you know I, I no one could identify with me because like even even when you are most people are sick they can they can go outside um, you know they're not that cut off from society or they can watch TV or movies or they can be on their phones so I, I felt so isolated but that really drove me to the Lord and to just telling him how I felt every day and journaling and that led me to start writing and I discovered that I was you know gifted at writing and that was, you know, a huge breakthrough for me because after the strokes, I'd been unable to play violin. They had, you know, I don't have the sensation and movement in my left hand that I did before. Um, so, so God was using that time as, as difficult and depressing as it seems to, to unlock these beautiful moments between me and him and to show me a different gifting. And so, so that's why I go back to, you know, the passage that I chose, you know, like I could ask the darkness to hide me in the light around me to become night. Like it was so tempting to just give in to how terrible things were and, and, you know, just really embrace the depression. But, you know, even that darkness was not dark to God, you know, like to me, to, to him, he was looking at me and like, it was bright daylight, you know, it could have been like the best summer's day possible. And, you know, the, our relationship, you know, needed, there was no reason to be depressed. You know, I had instant access to the God of the universe and he was right there listening to me and, and showing me these, these giftings that I had no idea I had and, and that he wanted me to use to glorify him. And, you know, if I had been super busy and running around with my old life, I, I would have had no idea I could write, you know, or anything like that. So um, moving forward, um, as, as time passed, um, I was... I had been afraid to reach out to our church and really be honest about what I was struggling with um, because with traumatic brain injury, I don't, I don't know if we have any um, veterans or people who've su suffered severe concussion, but even when you heal, you do have deficits um, that can be emotional, they can affect cognitively, you know, your ability to plan, your ability to process change, your ability to um, just process your own emotions and other people's emotions. And I was worried that if I let too many people into my life, that they would judge me and think I was sinful or weird or whatever. And so I, you know, really kept church people at a distance. But finally, God prompted us to really just be honest and invite, you know, the people from our church into our home and talk about what we were struggling with as a couple. And that, that was really like the beginning of a new, um, a new moment for us. And do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. And um, we have really, I mean, this slide says God intervenes, and he really did intervene in our lives in a real way. Um, we look forward to hopefully spending more time with you all afterwards. Um, I think there might be a little bit of a get-together after, but um, one, one just testimony I think that we can maybe conclude with is how um, in September of last year, we had a friend pray for grace that God would heal her seizures. And many have prayed for that before, and, and we believe that God can heal, but we also understand that often, you know, his, his choices um, may look different than what we might be expecting, but in this case, God did actually step in, and Grace has not had a seizure since September. Yeah. And yeah, we, 
we are so grateful for that at her worst. She was having eight to 10 seizures a day, and um, just to be free from seizures for, for this amount of time has been just such a huge blessing. But I think um, for me, uh, and then Grace, I think you can mm -hmm. yeah. um, conclude, but I, I would just like to share with you guys that um, I've learned so much through what God has allowed us to experience, but one takeaway for me is just realizing the brevity of this life. This life is just so, so short compared to the eternity that awaits us with God. Um, and when, the more we reflect on that, um, hopefully we can see how that can influence our day-to-day -day choices as well. Yeah, and just, just praising the Lord. I mean, if we hadn't really been honest about how bad my health, health was and my seizures were and, you know, the, the you know, brain problems that made it hard to make and keep friends, you know, like my friend would have never known to offer to pray for us. You know, so I, I, I think I just, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to be vulnerable with those around you and be vulnerable with your church and um, welcome people into the hard parts of your life and just ask for a prayer and cry out to God. Um, and, and you know, eat whether, whether he responds in kind, in kind or not, you know, I've obviously been praying for healing for f five years and, and, and had thought that the answer was no. And then lo and behold, you know, his, it was just not his time. Um, you know, so I, I would also just encourage you to, to never give up. Um, to don't, don't, don't assume that you know what God has planned or that you've figured out, you know, what, what the answer is, you know, because God can always surprise us. And I have no idea why it quote took so long or why I had to live in my apartment for that many years isolated, but I know that God taught me so many things that I would have never learned otherwise. And so would I, would I trade it for anything? No, I, I actually wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't trade that for you know, five years of health or, or socializing or whatever. And so, so yeah, I would just r remind you guys that, you know, if you are going through a dark time, you know, the darkness is not dark to God. The dark is as bright as the day and just cry out to him, be, be honest, be honest with those around you and, and just trust that whatever he's doing is going to glorify himself in an amazing way. And that it's going to be for your good and bless you and um, just mature you in, in ways that you could never, um, never possibly imagine. Um, so I would just like to close with that thought. And also if we could um, just go to the last slide and remind you guys, like we do have our book, Walking with Grace. If you want to read the long story, there's a ton of stuff that we cut out for this. Um, so feel free to take advantage of that. But um, otherwise, just thank you so much for your time and attention today. It's just been a privilege to speak to all of you. Um, God bless.